Thank you, moderator, and dear excellencies, dear sisters and brothers in the one humanity. Thank you for this opportunity to share also our reflections from the point of view of the World Council of Churches, which is actually much more than 110 churches. It is 350 churches in 110 countries, uh, representing more than half a billion believers. Uh, numbers are not what we should discuss, but I think we should be aware that Christians and Muslims together represent about half of the world's population. So as we are here, we are not talking about only ourselves. We are talking about humanity in many ways. And that is the first point I would like to make, that we as a World Council of Churches, we address these issues from many perspectives. But first of all, we address it from a theological perspective. What do we believe? And what does it mean to believe today in the one God that created the one humanity? And what are the implications of that in our time? Well, definitely it should not be that believing in one God is that we see only part of humanity as our sisters and brothers. There is an accountability to God that has to lead to an accountability and a mutual accountability to every human being. Every human being, whatever belief or not belief we have. And I think this is a very important entry point also to the reflection about the theme of today, working jointly to, towards equal citizenship. <coughs> it is not only a political or a legal principle, it is also a principle that expresses our deepest faith in the one God creating the one humanity. We see today in many ways that this is not an obvious this shared faith, not even in our Christian communities. Our Christian faith is also used to polarize the world, to polarize among people, and to even discriminate again and again others, even within the Christian community. We as the World Council of Churches have had since 1971 an interfaith office, and I'm honored to sit next to one of those who have been in that office for many years, His Excellency Tarek Mitri. And the Christian-Muslim relations have been one of the most important agendas for us, and it has become increasingly so over the last years. When we call our churches and all who want to join us for a pilgrimage of justice and peace, we want to express what we believe is our common agenda also for today. Let me share with you three examples, not taken out of the blue, but taken out of our own work of today, that illustrates how we try to address this in a practical way. One is built on an experience we had also with the Al-Azhar Mosque and the Sheikh Al-Azhar here in Geneva some months ago as he visited us in the World Council Churches with significant number of members of the uh, Muslim Council of Elders. And we met at an institute outside Geneva, our Bossi Ecumenical Institute, that celebrated its 70th anniversary. He represents an institution that has millions of students. We have 50 students, but we believe that we have the same purpose, namely to be a place where we work together to understand one another and one another's shared faith, also in a wider sense, and it was a significant sign that he wanted to come to visit one of our institutions for education, and actually our most significant program for education. And that leads to my second point. Um, a month ago, I led a visit of church leaders from different parts of the world to Iraq to visit both the political leadership, both in Baghdad and Erbil, but also the Christian leadership and the leadership of other faiths, particularly the Muslim faith. We were analyzing many dimensions of the effects of the tragedies in this country, some of them also coming definitely not only from the last years of violence and extreme violence by Daesh, but also the war that started in 2003 against a unified Christianity 
protesting against the idea at all of using invasion as a way to solve a political problem. And we announced then a prophecy that unfortunately has been seen fulfilled, namely that one of or the first effect of that invasion was that the Christian communities would be the victims of that effect, of that invasion. Today we have almost only one-tenth of Christians as we had 20 or 30 years ago in Iraq. Even more so important it is for us to visit them and to be part of their life. And they were both from their side but also from others we talked to given many examples of why it is such an opportunity now to find a way to rebuild Iraq. Rebuild Iraq as a country of peoples of many faiths. And the international community must now grasp this opportunity, hopefully after, over, uh, uh, after the release of Mosul and other cities, to now start really building this community with security, but also, and that is my point, second point, with a new uh, uh, attention to what do we teach? What do we teach in our schools about one another? And we realized when we asked that the curriculum in Iraq, in most schools, didn't really mention the others. Whether it was on the other, other side, for example, that there were not an awareness taught in these curriculum and textbooks about the Christian presence going centuries centuries back. This is of course a first basic entry to, to analyze but also to accept the citizenship of others that they exist. Not only as minorities and that can be a dubious word because it can also be sensed as a word that we don't really belong. Even if it's an issue of, of numbers. Therefore we are very careful not using that all the time but we also say communities those who belong here. Education. Another example I would like to mention, it's not from this, that part of the world, but it is from Nigeria. Together with Muslim representatives led by His Royal Highness Prince Ghazi and myself, and Christian leaders, we visited Nigeria, and particularly the northern part of Nigeria, to listen to the violence, to, to, to the victims of the violence done in the name of religion in that part of the world. And one of the outcome of the visit was that we initiated a joint institute in Kaduna, at the hotspot of the religiously based violence in Nigeria, where people should come together as Muslims and Christians to listen to the same stories, to help the victims, and to initiate new projects, particularly among young people, for coexisting and living together. And when we launched this center last year, the governor of Kaduna State, said, this is one of the signs of hope in our country. And let it be the day we leave behind us the rhetorics that we always say before we are saying that we are from Kaduna and from Nigeria, that we say, I'm a Muslim or I'm a Christian. Let us be the human beings of citizens in this city and this country before we identify ourselves by our religious communities. I think that is a word for all of us. Let me end by saying these are not questions that we face only in parts of the world I mentioned now. In my own country, Norway, in the other parts of Europe today, we see that citizenship, which we have as a basis in most of these countries, is not only a matter of a legal principle. It is a matter of how do we understand one another as human beings. And of course, these human rights, we claim that are belonging to all of us and also express our own humanity, must be expressed also to those who have not yet got citizenship in another country but had to flee their own country. We are very ashamed that some countries actually discriminate refugees based on religion and particularly that they say you are not welcome because you are a Muslim to our Christian country. We are very ashamed and we hope that this will not be what we will see in other parts of Europe or other parts of the world, whether it is in the name of this religion or in other religions. Thank you for this opportunity to share our reflections and we are happy to be part of the conversation.